Um, so, this evening's talk, um, our special guest is Susanna Medina. Um, Susanna is the author of Red Towels, which she co-translated with Rosie Marto. And also she's written the, the book which she'll be, I think, talking mainly about this evening, um, which is here, Philosophical Toys, um, published in 2015. Um, and as, as, as um, Susanna put it, it's the, uh, the offspring of which are the praised short films um, of the Noel's philosophical toys and leather-bound stories co-directed by Derek Osborne, Osborne. Susanna's other books are the Poetry and Aphorisms collection entitled, and I'm not very good at, is it French? I think it's in French. Uh, Souvenir del Accidente and Borghese Land, a voyage through the infinite imaginary places, labyrinths of Buenos Aires and other psychogeographies and figments of space. <laughs> Susanna was awarded the Max Alb International Short Story Prize and is the recipient of a writing grant from the Arts Council of England and her novel Spinning Days of Night, for her novel Spinning Days of Night. Her story, Oestrogen, translated by Rosie Marto, is featured in Best European Fiction. Um, and Susanna has published a number of essays on literature, art, cinema and photography, and curated various well-received international art shows in abandoned spaces. Um, before I continue, I might explain that I'll be very, working very closely with Susanna, um, because Susanna has a sort of a, can I say, a hearing, hearing impediment. So I'll be sort of working closely so that we can take question things. time. Yes, yes, in question time. So without further ado, I'm very delighted to introduce to our special guest, Susanna Medina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm supposed to, to sit down, yeah? Uh, no, you can stand up if you want. I'm supposed to sit down. No, you can yeah. stand up. Right, uh, thank you for coming. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, uh, very pleased about it. Uh, thank you to Lawrence uh, Foe for doing this talk. And a special thanks to Mrs. Bruce here, who is a pupil, uh, who's a student of Derek's, my partner. She studies art and she insisted that I get in touch with. Uh, Lawrence Ford to do this talk. So a special thanks to Mrs. Bruce and I was thinking through it and it's, it's quite special because I've been meaning to set up uh, talks and so forth and I've been unable to because of family things. So suddenly there's someone who I don't know uh, who contacts the local librarian and says, you know, this person should do this talk, so that's very nice, thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking about philosophical toys. Um, I have a little sentence here about a local library, so I just think I'll read it because libraries are very special, they're sacred, sacred places, I think. Uh, they're very, yeah, special. So it's just a little sentence. Uh, the following day, I ended up at the local library, walls of knowledge, enthusiastic students, the unemployed, and angelic souls. And I like to put emphasis on the angelic souls because I just think people that go to libraries, you know, are very special. Uh, also, uh, I hear that. Um, I've, I've seen this map and I hear that libraries and li librarians especially, they're all very quiet and, you know, they're secretly plotting the revolution. So, <laughs> you know, we have to be careful with them. Uh, but librarians are also very special. Um, right, well, I think most of you haven't read this book, have you? And I'm going to tell you all about it. And I just think I'm going to be giving you so many spoilers uh, that, you know, too many spoilers. But anyway, so what I decided 
Uh, this is the book. I'm going to read you first uh, the first two paragraphs to give you a feel of the book. And then I will tell you more about it, about how it went. Right, so the first chapter is called The Sex Appeal of the Inorganic. Nina, my name is Nina, the same as my mother's. It comes from the Italian, from Antonina. But in Catalan, Nina means doll. But it's not only my name. I talk of small things because they have been. A recurring cipher at the center of my life. Also, those years, the years I'm writing about, toys had become ubiquitous. My friends kept giving me small toys as presents, kitsch gadgets, playful objects. I gave them similar trinkets. And then I felt, I started to sense, that these trashy toys were relevant players in the hypnotic ritual of post-industrial life. That's what I said to Chris one Sunday afternoon when we were caught up in a traffic jam of serving passers-by, sucking lollipops while building the free toy from a chocolate kinder egg. These small polymer things these trashy trinkets. There is a kind of spell in them, I said. My father used to call them Hong Kong rubbish, Chris said. Then, a fragile adolescent running on stilettos crossed the street majestically. When we got back home with shopping bags full of libidinal prints, and unpacked them, I stared at the mess of packaging and multicolored stripy G-strings and thought about my mother's pair of black boots. I thought that I would have never thought about toys if it wasn't for Mary Jane. That I would have never linked them to my mother's shoes, Nina Chiavelli's high heel shoes, if it wasn't for a chance encounter that forged my subjective dictionary to collapse them under the same concept. Then the words of a shoe fetishist telling me that for him high heels became alive flashed through my mind. That made me realize that I still hadn't told Chris about my parents' weird little secret about my adventures. Right, well, so I was saying that these two paragraphs introduce lots of elements and names that will later uh, unfold throughout the book. Uh, and one of the questions Lawrence asked me to ask, uh, uh, to talk about, is how did philosophical toys come about? That's a big question. I think a book many times takes years, decades to, to, to come together. And there are many, many events. I mean, it has multiple sources uh, what, where it comes from. I mean, it, it can be triggered by a single event, of course. But many times there are many things that have happened, many different interests uh, that make a book uh, that make a writer want to write a book. Uh, with philosophical toys, there are many concerns that, that I have in, in some of my other works. I, I have always been interested in, in art, in gender, in sexual politics, in the irrational, the unconscious, is something that really interests me. Uh, in cinema, in the image, I'm very interested in the image, visual 
visual writing, all my writing is very visual. I've always been around art, I love art, and I love the image. So it's all very visual. Uh, all those concerns are there. Uh, we're already there and, and are also here in my book. So th these are things that have recurred in my work like a chorus. I mean, they keep happening. And so I had this soup already, that soup was there. Uh, something else, I, I would have written something else on, on the same soup, <laughs> probably would have, you know, uh, come into the book. Now, all those concepts were there. Uh, when I started writing philosophical toys, I was interested, uh, I, I became interested in, in, I was interested in sexuality and sexual politics. But with sexuality, when I found out about sexual fetishism, I thought that it was very strange <coughs> that someone should uh, become fixated with an object. And I thought it was really interesting, and I thought, well, what was this? You know, you are young and you find out about these things. I mean, you can find out about, of course, things that are much more weird, <laughs> you know. Anyway, so I found out about this, and I just thought that it was quite strange. I was fascinated by it. Um, I was doing an MA in Hispanic studies. I was brought up in Spain, but I have spent a long, long time in England. Uh, like probably almost 30 years in England. In fact, it's very nice to be here because when I first came to England, uh, I used to live in a place where we didn't have a bar for a shower. So I used to come to Paddington Library, to this centre, to the swimming pool, <laughs> <laughs> to have a shower. So here I am, you know, after so many years, who would have guessed? You know, here I am talking. But, and that little thing I mentioned in a short story in, in another book called Red Tales. Uh, but anyway, so I was saying about all these concerns with philosophical toys. I was doing this MA, and my uh, tutor allowed me to do a creative project because he knew that, she knew that I wanted, you know, to write something else. So she allowed me to do that. And I thought, I'll, I'll work on Buñuel, the filmmaker. Uh, I've always been very interested in surrealism. So I thought I'll work on Buñuel. And then there was this other thing, which was, uh, you know, okay, Buñuel, what? Uh, I was interested in fetishism, the image, and all these things. I looked at his films and I found there, you know, a treasure trove of, of what I was looking for. And nobody had researched that, so that was very interesting. Uh, so I, I worked on that, and the first, let's say, the very first outline on philosophical toys comes from, from that work. Uh, when I, when, I, when I was doing my MA. The other day, it's really interesting, the other day I came across a fax, because when I lost my hearing, I could only communicate by fax with my partner when I was in Spain. So I sent my partner, I was reading through these faxes oh, the no, other day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting, because the first, the very first idea is from March, I think it's March 2000. Yeah, and I had this idea already. But it's quite different from the book, but that comes to show how ideas develop. Uh, I have this idea where the protagonist is a closet fetishist, he's doing film studies, and he's very complete, he's completely obsessed about Buñuel. He writes his essays, but the footnotes grow larger and larger until he says they become completely surreal. <laughs> uh, he goes to a shrink, thereby discovering that, that he has transferred his fetishism onto footnotes. The novel has nothing to do with this, and I might write something about this footnote obsession. 
But the, the first idea was someone obsessed with footnotes instead of feet or shoes. It was someone obsessed with footnotes. And I've got evidence <laughs> from 2000. So that's very nice that I, I found this literally two days ago. There was an idea there. It wasn't developed, but you know, some ideas were there already. So I was saying about all this interest and also Philosophical Toys is the first work I've written in English. All my other works are in Spanish. So when, when I started writing Philosophical Toys, what I thought is right, okay, I'm going to start writing fiction in English. Uh, I have to work with limitations because English is not my native language. I have vocabulary limitations, I have linguistic limitations. Um, and uh, it was an experiment. Okay, I'm going to experiment. My Spanish work was very, very language based. It was very writerly. So I thought I have to use other uh, other techniques, other things to to do some nice piece of writing, not language. So the language has to be kept more or less simple. Uh, an experiment, there's a, a French group called Unipor who experimented uh, with literature. Some of you might know about Unipor. Uh, the, the most well-known writer is George Perec and he wrote a novel without the letter E. <coughs> Everything he wrote had to be without the letter E. So I thought, well, if he could do that, I can probably write in English. <laughs> 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 you know, so it was along those lines, the experiment. And another thing, um, uh, a very, and another example very dear to me is Beckett. And there's, there's um, a friend here, Mog, who's written a book about Beckett. You can talk to her uh, later on. Because Beckett started writing in French, and he took his language down to his bare minimum. He loved Joyce so much that he went the other extreme. <laughs> when, when he began writing, he became anti joyce he wanted to write in a completely different way because Joyce was so amazing. What, he, what would he do? He went the other way and his language is really basic. So those were two examples that uh, propelled me uh, to write in English. Uh, so it was it's, you know, a challenge and it was interesting also because I was wary, I was a bit tired of the traditional novel. And, Writing in English made it more exciting because I was learning English along the way. So, uh, one thing that I recently wrote an article about the process of, of this book is, is publishing necessary fiction is on the net. And other things that I realized while writing the article. There's this little book, this little book, Essays on Those, I love little books. I mean, I think they're very special. And it's got essays by Heinrich von Kleist, Charles Baudelaire, and Rainer Maria Rourke. Okay? It's a little book, Essays on Doors. And it was around my studio for a long time. I loved the, brev the brevity. The and there's an essay by Charles Baudelaire called The Philosophy of Toys which I read. Okay. When I started Philosophical Toys, the title of the essay came to my mind. My book has nothing to do with the essay uh, from, by Baudelaire. Uh, philosophical Toys, I, I don't know whether you, you've come across the term, but they're scientific, scientific toys. They're pre-cinema toys. Uh, like, you know, like sewer traps, uh, the kind of 
pre-cinema toys where one image moves to show images in motion, those kind of toys. I didn't know that, and I think that's why Baudelaire talks about the philosophy of toys. The title, Philosophical Toys, came to my mind because I was, you know, I had read the essay, so that was there already. Uh, but also, I was thinking about shoes to begin with. And I was thinking about shoes as objects of inquiry, because how strange that an object, you know, a shoe can become such a fascinating thing for a fetishist. So it was a kind of joke calling the book Philosophical Toys, because it was like, really, it was mainly about shoes. So it's like shoes are, you know, objects of inquiry. They become objects of philosophy, you know, because how come, you know, how come that's so fascinating? Okay, but the title, again, it has two words, philosophical toys. It's very interesting because you can say that every word branches out into its own universe. I mean, every word has so many different associations, okay? And with philosophical, straight away I titled the book Philosophical Toys. And my, my MA thesis was called Bunuel's Philosophical Toys. Uh, so, with the title came two things in the novel. Nina, the main protagonist, becomes a philosopher. She, can't, she becomes a, a philosopher because she inherits from her parents a question, what is fetishism? So, that is her weird inheritance. She inherits something that she doesn't understand. So she becomes a philosopher through this kind of, of inheritance. Um, and then toys. I was interested in toys. Another reason why I was interested in toys is because uh, some artists from my generation uh, were using toys in their artwork. And I found that really interesting to see all these toys and, and to see, let's say, the, the kidification of culture, you know, how consumerism really encouraged you to become a child, how that has is, 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 has good things about it. I mean, we all, you know, it's, I think it's good to cherish your inner child, it's fantastic. At the same time, there is a kind of infantilization of everybody, and, and there are many things, you know, if you think about Dyson Hoover's, but they look the nice plastics and, and there are many objects that are designed in such a way and especially when I was writing this that you know they kind of infantilize infantilize us and we like that and, and maybe we don't. It's like, you know, there's a true and fro there with, with these ideas. So two words brought their own their own strand of of content for the book. I was interested in toys and I was interested so I was interested in toys, I was interested in shoes and then I became really interested in objects generally. So in a way although uh, the book talk the, the plot of the book is about shoes uh, that is a springboard to talk about our, our fascination with objects in general. How we're so fascinated by objects, you know, what we wear, how we present ourselves, our houses, you know, objects are amazing. So that is a springboard. Uh, another thing that this, this little booklet, which is amazing, another thing about this little booklet, Essays on Doors, is that as you heard at the beginning, Nina, my name is Nina, in Catalan it means door. Okay, those are the first words that I wrote when I wrote my novel. And in a way, I think they come from this book as well, Essays on Doors. I mean, some, somewhere in my head, I made these kind of connections, and the character ended up being called Nina. So, thank you <laughs> to this book. It's things that, you know, you have these ideas, and then you start trying to trace them back. Just think, 
Hamas have had this idea because of this. You know, I came up with this. I wrote Nina, and that sounded right to me. From the beginning, I didn't know any Ninas, and all my previous works, more or less, the characters have no name. They're called she or he or, or you know. So with this, I think uh, definitely it was like a very nice influence, uh, if you want, in, in, a, in a very weird way, because, but it was. Uh, get it. <laughs> get this as well, get this. This is, very, this is a very nice little booklet. Um, okay, so other things about this book. Uh, you can see the cover, and the, the cover, uh, Derek of One and I did a little film called Leatherbound Stories. And another thing that uh, recurs throughout my work is parents as emissaries of the irrational. Parents as people that you find out they might not be all that. You know, parents are supposed to be educators. And when you grow up, you find out all these things about them that might not be that rational. Or, you know, you wonder whether that you should be following their example or, or to what extent, you know. Most people have, you know, large doses of irrational or whatever, you know. So, um, shoes, the inheritance, she finds out that some shoes are her father's lot. <coughs> Uh, and that's when she starts inquiring, what is this? Were they my mother's? Because her mother died when she was six. She starts, and, and so the, the, the novel progresses through questions, questions, questions. And my idea about all these shoes, uh, in a way as well, and that's another idea, and that's why I'm saying that I think some books come through a cluster of ideas was that, uh, you know, shoes, that inheritance as the baggage you get from your parents. You know, what you inherit from your parents is a baggage of things, you know, some things you might want and some things you might not want. And that is the metaphor. All these boxes she's carrying, all her mother's shoes across London, uh, and that is a metaphor for what we, we have to deal with. Uh, for better and for worse, we have some kind of, of inheritance, genetic and psychological. So we, we deal with these things. So um, that was another idea. Thinking about, I'm talking because I was asked to, how did it come about? Okay. Another thing that during the mm, mid-90s, I used to write our reviews a lot, and I reviewed this uh, show. I don't know whether you saw it at, at the Royal Academy. There was this show called Art from the Continent, Africa. It was about Africa. And it was, it was truly fascinating. And there was these power figures, I don't know whether you've come across, they're called power figures or, or nail, nail power figures, fetishes. There are these figures completely covered with nails. You know, if you think about voodoo, they're called power figures and they're covered. So I was really fascinated by that. And that's way before everything that I've told you uh, you know, the, the, the little book, the, the facts, all that. Uh, I was fascinated by these power figures. They were called fetishes. And the fact is that the, the fetishes come from, it's, it's a Portuguese word, fetiche. And it comes from 17th century Portugal. And the word was used uh, to designate these objects made by Africans. And it was a, a derogatory uh, name. It, it, was, it was used to put them down. 
us non-rational, you know. So, lots of things converged. Uh, my interest in the, rush, in the rational, uh, these power figures that are so amazing and that Westerners, uh, you know, invented a word to put down Africans. <laughs> uh, you know, Africans are art because now it's considered art. You know, but at the time, for 70th century people, it's like these savages, you know, they're putting nails, like, they're making wooden sculptures and, and you know, putting nails in there. I think that, 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 that amazing. So all this interest, I mean, I don't mention that here, but how the word came about is very interesting. So this, this book is full of ideas. And that's something that follows on from other works that I've done, other books. Because so I'm interested in, uh, well, like with Red Tails, my previous book, it was narrative interwoven with poetic fragments. And that creates tensions. And with this book, uh, I was interested in ideas coming to the foreground. So instead of the ideas being dissolved in the narrative, uh, you know, so you have a, a little idea here and a little idea there, I want the, the ideas to, to come to the, to the foreground. Uh, and that is how the book is experimental, because, you know, instead of a character saying la la la, you know, the, the, the normal dialogue or whatever, it's more these strains of thoughts, but it's heavily plotted and the story is there. The story carries these ideas, so it's heavily plotted. So that was my idea, to do something that was, uh, that, that was different. Uh, and, it, and it comes from having done that in different ways, uh, you know, all the way. So going back to the word fetish, uh, I, I love research, I really enjoy it. And I think now, well, for, for those who are really into the internet, that you can research anything, it's, it's just like, you know, I, I mean, it's going to completely replace sex <laughs> and, and love. I mean, how can love compare with the internet? <laughs> one person, how can one person compare to the internet? It's impossible. The internet is amazing. You have access to all this amazing knowledge, right? Whatever you want. I mean, there are some things that are not there, I think. But anyway, you can check something. That's not there, I'm amazing. It's amazing. So I, I wrote a chapter about the genealogy, the origin of the term fetish, how it comes and how it develops, because it's a very important it's a, it's a very important concept for modern culture. You know, we now use it like I have a fetish for that, meaning I like this, you know, I like this thing. But the way it's been th used throughout, well, since the 17th century, 16th, 17th century, is quite different. And quite a few big brains have uh, used the term. And one is Marx who talks about commodity fetishism that links to consumerism. I hope, yeah, that links to consumerism. I mean, he's talking about, you know, he's also being, being uh, derogatory to Africans, using the term in a, in a derogatory way, you know, saying that people that buy have this kind of highly irrational, you know, attitude or consumers, which we do. I mean, it's, it's, we, we do, and there are good things about it, and maybe things that are more obscure about it. And another big brain that uh, talked about fetish is Freud. Uh, and, well, if you, if you read the book, it would be great if you read the book. Uh, there's a chapter called The Pinus Nightmare, I was saying, because that relates to Freud and his theories. And 
well, somehow is very popular with women. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I talk about those ideas as well, uh, and that was through research. Uh, another big abs aspect, as I told you, I, I said, you know, um, I did my research on Buñuel, and then I had to invent, like, you know, you have to invent so many things. So, okay, why Buñuel? What happens? So there's a collector who starts collecting Buñuel pieces. You know, I wrote about something that I feared, and, and at the time I didn't know. So all her trips to Spain, I didn't know I would be doing that, but it was obvious that I would have to do that at some point. At the time I wrote about it, I didn't know. So, you know, um, there are many things, of course, many aspects to the book that uh, I would like to discuss, but, you know, we have to stay here a week or something. <laughs> uh, I think they won't let Maybe us. You should read that part uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the book, uh, and a little bit. I've chosen this in the launch. I was going to read this, and I forgot. I forgot it at home. I read other things, but this. There's many different little bits in the book. I chose this one. Uh, anyway, this is something she writes uh, when she's in a cafe, and she's trying to write about about Buñuel, and she can't. So she writes something completely different. And it's, it's one of the bits about objects that, in the book, there are many bits about, different bits about objects. So it's called Object Hyperballot. Some objects are maps of moments, and other objects are emotional maps that contain, in intricate detail, the whole memory of an experience. And then, there are things that trigger love at first sight. Things that leave you in a lukewarm state of indifference. Things that were desirable a decade, a decade ago and have now become ex-desirable things. And things that you wouldn't mind killing. There are also happy things full of disturbing potential. That can always become things of horror, such as a cheerful clown mask painted in creepy garish colours. And then the sickly sweet kitsch figurines that you befriend out of unconditional love towards their owner like the porcelain little girls and puppies in your arms, living room. Then there are all these trashy gifts that you hope to recycle at the earliest opportunity in the near future. Objects from hell designed to fill you up with frustration and all the unexpected things that turn up after being in hiding for years in what was an unexplainable emotional exile. And sadly, that the personal effects of the disappeared. And there are also vicious things of violence that speak about the darkness at the center of the world, such as a machine gun, a beautifully crafted revolver. The hilarious things designed by demented people that make you laugh out aloud. Like for instance, a dressed up singing car that suddenly flushes her others. Lost things that you hope will turn up one day and things that are lost forever so many gloves, scarves, and keys, and gloves, and umbrellas. 
There are also things that you just can't throw away in case they're useful in a rather hypothetical future. And stolen things that embody a thrilling moment. There are all things that are not old enough and just look old fashioned. Throw away things that have absolutely nothing redeemable about them. And then there are all these things that will probably outlive you. The bastards. <laughs> And there are also dreamlike things, semiotically neutral things, whose year of fabrication would be hard to trace, and streamlined things of the future encoded in the here and now. Lackluster things afflicted with a generally depressed aura that ask you for compassion. knowing that sometimes they will get it and other times they won't. And then there are indestructible things that convey unbroken resilience. Things of love that ward off bad mojo and damaged things that remind you of the fragility of life. And then there are things that can be extremely useful, but can also become things of danger, like a knife or an axe with perfectly sharp blades. And there are promiscuous things, such as lighters, pens, and paper clips. Things that have only been used once, and things of nostalgia that your grandmother gave you. There are things that mimic an expensive material in a cheaper material, underscoring power and social relations, and old damaged things that you can't bring yourself together to throw away. Playful things of lust and transformation, such as wigs, handcuffs, feathers, and stilettos. And then there are also these cast of things on the streets that look back at you, longing mm. to be acknowledged. And then there are things that scream with status, and things that scream with muteness, and things that belong to plastic fantastic culture whose fragments end up bursting out of the guts of Albatros' cheeks. And then, and then, and then, okay. So, this summarizes, uh, well, ideas that we have with objects, about objects. Uh, and I think it's question time. If you want to ask any questions, uh, of course, you know, we can't be here a whole week, so <laughs> sorry, you know, we have to deal with questions. Um, has, there, has anybody got any questions that come to mind for Susanna? So would you describe this as a philosophical novel? Would you have to relate to me? Would you describe it as a psychological novel? So is it a psychological novel? Um, you mean philosophical toys? Yeah. Would you well, partly yes. Yeah, about the psychology of the protagonist. I think all, all novels... Most, most novels are psychological. Yeah in some way or another because you know we are we are we are psychological, we are people, so if we speak about people, 
you know, of course, he's talking about her father's thing, all these things. So, you know, their psycho, their, let's say their, psych their psychology of the narrator, of the protagonist, in a way, she's a bit of a wire because she's spying. Uh, she's found out about these things and she's, try she's trying to understand. But there's something also quite naughty in, in, in the idea that you would really try to, you know, pray open your parents' uh, secret. So in that way it is, yes. This is your first novel in English. Yes. Okay. Your, your other work has been in Spanish, which is which is your language. Yes. You said the, your other books were literary, which which to me means um, written well with attention to, to literature, rather than a, a book that has ideas. The, the, I have okay. a question. Okay. So what I wanted to say is this, from what you've said, is a book with amazing ideas. For me, everything you've said, I find very interesting, and I'll be queuing up to get a book. But was it very difficult to do, to do it in English when it came to the subtlety? of expressing a, a very complicated idea. Fetishism is quite complicated. Um, what I was saying about my Spanish work is that it's very language-based, you know, this love for language. And in, in some ways, it's interesting when you're working in a, in a different language, uh, because to some extent, uh, whatever you can thought, whatever you can think is limited by by, by the language by the language that you have. You have these tools, and the only thing that you can do is, is with these tools. So I I, I, I had taken that on board, and I, and I and I wanted to exploit it. I just thought, okay, this is my situation. I'll do my best. But the good thing. If your native language is really good, right, is that you can always use dictionaries <laughs> because you already have, you know, yes. you already have a, a huge thing there. So you can always, you know, think. It's, it's not as if I thought in translation because I didn't. But if, if if I did need a concept or I wasn't sure about it, or or I didn't quite know. You know, I, I would check the dictionary, or I would, but that gives you a lot of. Other um, information. Yeah, yeah. If, if your first language is very good, then your other languages you can, you know, manage much better. That's 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 how the brain works. You know that it allows you to to build. So if you have a good class, you know, nicer you bridges. Language, yeah. Then you are better equipped to. Learn and absorb other languages. Um, if you have a good grasp of your own language, you have a better, um, better idea of uh, other languages. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. You, you can understand things mm. better. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, Susanna is saying yes. You have a better idea. She agrees yeah. with you. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. You can tell people about the film a bit more. Tell people about the film. Yeah. Well, yes. With this, um, with the, with this book, there are two offsprings. One is called When You Ask Philosophical Toys. It's on the on the internet. In in, well, you just type When You Ask Philosophical Toys, and. I made a little film of all the fragments in Buñuel where all the instances of shoe fetishism. And that worked really well and it circulated a lot. And we made the film in three days. I made it with Derek, he was the editor. I'm very lucky to have an, an amazing artist at home. And he's also a very good editor, Derek Bond there. Uh, 
he's mixed media, so so it was very good that um, you know he was there. So let's make this film. And then I was invited. Uh, I was invited to do a reading, and they said, "Why don't you do an abstract video?" Blah 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 with a reading. And I thought, okay. And then we filmed a little girl because there's a little girl. Well, there's a little girl in the book. Yes, the protagonist when she was little. So we filmed this little girl. I was going to do an abstract film just with objects, just objects, and then, and then reading, right? And um, we filmed this little girl, and I just thought the film has to be a narrative film. And we also had a very tight deadline. The guy who invited me to, to do the reading didn't know that I was making a film. So in one month with no budget or anything, we very quickly make a film. Uh, it worked really well. It's a very nice little film. There's a trailer in YouTube. It's called Leatherbound Stories. It's mentioned at the back here. And I don't know, it's got many interesting uh, facts to to it. The film is so the really nice. Is a condensed version of the Sorry? It's a condensed version of the book, isn't it? Well, it's an extremely, I mean, in a way, it's almost like another, it's an extremely condensed, I, I we worked really quickly in one month, we did everything, no budget, no nothing, we did everything, and I condensed my book into 12 pages. <laughs> so, you know, it leaves out lots of things. But one thing very interesting, and I would like to make another film, is that um, I had to get all these shoes. I didn't know how. <laughs> you know, how do I get all these shoes? <laughs> you know, tank. How do I get a hundred pairs of shoes? So I got my credit card <laughs> and bought lots of shoes with the intention of returning them. <laughs> <laughs> So I felt like a really rich, you know, rich girl with all these boxes with, you know, amazing shoes. I was scared about, you know, losing the receipts or, you know, I just bought really beautiful. If you if you get to watch the film one day, really. Did the film come before the book? Did the film come first? Yeah. It, like no, no, no. Well, mm. afterwards. afterwards. Yeah, I, I condensed the script. You uh, what, you saw the film, didn't you? Yes. I condensed the book into 12 pages. So, so yeah, all this amazing shopping, you know, and I just think it's amazing you could m probably make a film just like that, you know, just like go shopping and, and, you know, you have 28 eight days to return things in, in many... <laughs> I love returning. But in, in some places I bought quite a few, like five pairs. It's just like feeling really rich. It's part of making the film. I had to get all these shoes. Uh, so that, that's an interesting thing about the film. The, the, way, the way we made it. It's good, good fun. And, and it went well, you know. It's like... Uh, yeah, it was good. <laughs> And there's beautiful bits about, I've read something quite abstract maybe, but there's many beautiful bits there about, you know, the beauty of shoes and how they are more like sculptures. Well, some shoes. Did you get like a critic in the paper? Was there a, a review? Did they get a review? You said something about a film. You know, like you get film critics. Was there any kind of like feedback? Well, yes, there was feedback. People okay. have written about it. I mean, was it good feedback? Back? Yeah, good feedback. Okay. Okay. Yes, it, what was it? Uh, I can't remember. Mesmerized. <laughs> 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 was it in my mouth? Was it in my mouth? Yes. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I've got a question, uh, Susanna. I have a question. Um, which authors inspire you? Which is your, you know, which, where do you draw your inspiration from with regard to authors? Uh? Uh, 
my, I have a lot of favorite authors, many favorite authors, and they keep, they keep on changing, you know, throughout the years, they just change, and I think when you write something, it's almost like everything you've read, everything you've lived, everything you've dreamt, everything you've desired, that might end up there. So it's not just everything you've read. But there are many authors, I mean, I, I did my PhD on Borges, who was a librarian. So, you know, I, I don't think Borges has influenced me because he's, he's such a huge thing. You know, he's such a huge author. And I think to imitate authors is always, you know, a fatal mistake. I, I mean, I wouldn't uh, encourage anybody to do that. And some people write Borges like stuff and it's fascinating, but you really have to, I don't know, you really have to, to be in that kind of, you know, want to do that. Many authors, there's Borges, uh, there's J.G. Bala, he's a British author, I really like J.G. Bala. Uh, I always say that the writer is a poet, and the poet who encouraged me to write is Walt Whitman, uh, Leaves of Grass. And the reason for that is a humorous one, because uh, when I was kind of 14, 14, 15, I was really into smoking grass. And I saw this book called Leaves of Grass. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought it was about grass. And I started reading it, I just thought this is so much better. <laughs> I, it's just like, it's so good. You know, I, that really, cha that, cha that book completely changed my life because when I read it, I just really loved it. I really loved it and I just thought this is amazing. It's in, uh, have you read Leaves of Grass? It's a beautiful, it's so beautiful. In Leaves of Grass, it's a pantheist book. Life is celebrated. Walt Whitman celebrates everything. He celebrates because he's in the spirit of, you know, d democracy, you know. But he was a pantheist and he's celebrating and singing everything in nature. And that, I would say, in some ways, that's the book, maybe the book that has inspired me the most in my life's trajectory. Because it has given me a great respect to, you know, for the diversity of people, nature, uh, situations, you know. Uh, and that's what he's, He's singing. That's what he's celebrating, and I think that's that's very interesting when you start uh, cherishing diversity instead of thinking in a you know in terms of very small uh, fields. When you realise that life is so so wonderful. Anybody got any more questions they'd like to put to Susanna? No. <laughs> have a question. No. No. Next book. Next, Next book. book. Are you writing another book? Yes, I'm writing a book called Spinning Days of Night. And it's, it's, a, it's about, the book is about when I lost my hearing. Uh, that was very dramatic. Uh, it happened in 98. And again, there's lots of interesting ideas there that I'm dealing with because trauma, silence, silence. Imagine I lived in silence for, you know, well, I struggled with, with silence and sound for three years before I had a cochlear implant. I have a cochlear implant. And technology, of course, because technology is, is amazing, and this is amazing. So there's many, many ideas to do, you know, uh, illness, fragility, 
you know, m many ideas to do with that. And that, in a way, connects with, is interesting, and it's the factors that reminded me as well, that when I, I told you that um, I was sending faxes to my partner, uh, that this book, I started having ideas about it when I lost my hearing. And I started writing it when I lost my hearing. And then I had my cochlear implant, and that was dealing with a different situation, because although it's marvelous, it does have limitations. But I continued writing this book. So in a way, it was written uh, It, it was written, it's not that it was, I'm a writer, that's it. It's not that I wrote it as therapy, but undoubtedly it was a, a good thing for me to do because I had a lot of things to deal with after the illness and the cochlear implant and all that. So because I was really busy writing this, you know, uh, I didn't focus on, on other yeah, other things. And I'm doing that now. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so any, any, we could explore the, the, the idea about silence a lot, lot more, you know, but I think perhaps for another, another time. Yeah. I'm sure it's a very interesting subject. Although it's obviously been very, well, it's very, very trying for you, a very difficult subject, isn't it, mm. I think. But, um, but it's interesting. It's very interesting yes. because we live in such a noisy society. Yes, we need silence. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've always really liked silence anyway. Mm. Not like <laughs> <laughs> talking of which. You know, yes, yes. It's so, like an awful. Yes. Um, it, it's something you know. It's something that occupies my mind. It's a, working, you know, as a library professional, you know, the issue of silence or the opposite. But anyway, I, we, we, we must explore that another time. Um, so um, um, I think we'll sort of wind it up now. And I'm very grateful for, um, for you, 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 take, you and Derek take, taking the time to come and talk to the group. Um, it's been a very interesting subject, uh, what you've been very interesting ideas you've been talking about. Um, so um, just to say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that there are copies of uh, Philosophical Toys. Um, how much is I it? I can sign them for yeah. you. I sit there or I, or yeah. I stay here. Um, so how? Uh, they're 11 pounds uh, and two 20 pounds. And there's this new hashtag that I hear is going to be used in Twitter, which is uh, Philosophical Toys Christmas Craze. <laughs> You know, for, I think, do you think it's a good hashtag? <laughs> eh? Yeah? <laughs> Philosophical toys, because it's a Christmas, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Well, it's got the toys thing. Yes. <laughs> you like it? Yeah? Anyway, so, so we thought we'd start, we'll, we'd let you in into this little secret. <laughs> the Christmas craze. Mm. So, come and I'll sign it, if you want to get it. Thank I'm you. Here. Thank you.